Okay, I'm just going to check. Yes, it's working. Um, don't hold it at the bottom. <laughs> so, I mean, we're bringing together two sessions, the first of the day and the last, which is um, quite lovely and cyclical. Um, is there anybody who wants to kick off? Did you want to? Come up, yeah. Come up. Victoria, you seem to have a, a question. I so enjoyed today. Really, really enjoyed it. But um, what I wanted to ask was, um, considering how like, our modern day understandings have evolved so much from the past, um, you know, and some ideas of what madness is have almost been debunked um, through through analysis and greater greater kind of psychiatric, psychological, medical understandings and so on. Um, what is the panel's feeling now at the end of this symposium um, on the idea of madness? symposium probably ever like this one where I was so affected affected uh, viscerally affected by uh, what was being presented so it might just be me because I'm really sick <laughs> and I'm on a lot of medication um, <laughs> for lemon sip and stuff okay um, but I really felt that it was an ex extremely powerful representation of madness, um, both historical but also contemporary. So I don't think that there is a debunking of madness. I actually think that it's still very much a part of um, our culture. It may have uh, transformed and um, into other ways of um, being uh, manifest or embodied, but I think that so many of the talks today were so much about the contemporary uh, relationship to that we have as subjects to something that's called madness, whether it's psychosis or hallucination or um, hoarding. Um, I think I echo that sense of um, I don't think that madness is concluded as a subject um, in the sense, I think there is a narrative of progress that we have in increasing psychiatric understanding and actually I think the more you dig into that the shakier the ground is really in health outcomes in terms of major mental illnesses are, are, are no better now than they were in the middle of the 20th century so I would contest the idea that that, that we have progressed as far as perhaps we collectively delude ourselves that we have um, and for me, I guess one of the things I would say is that um, madness or mental illness, whatever you want to call it, are, are problems of people, um, not biology, not simply biology. And therefore, uh, I don't think being a human hasn't been concluded. And therefore, I don't think madness can have been concluded. And I guess the thing that I find really striking and exciting about today is that about what the clinical lessons might be. Um, what can psychiatry or clinical practice learn from art? And one of the things that I think that we've explored today is how art thinks in dimensional manners. And um, so we've thought about embodied um, understanding or understanding by objects or whatever it is. And so I wonder if 
what might be exciting to think about is how we actually have a productive dialogue between clinical and artistic practice that isn't one as the handmaiden to the other or paying lip service to art. And so I think this is what this environment offers. Yeah, no, I, I really agree with that. Okay. Um, I think that the elephant in the room, as well, in terms of looking forward rather than um, at our present moment or backwards, is um, is actually economics. That it, it it's one of the things that didn't come up particularly in any of our. Um, presentations and I think that it's interesting to think of our uses to science but also how that might be one of the last bastions of funding for the arts as well that actually in being useful we will also get paid and I, I find that quite interesting at this moment um, and I'm interested to think about how that might create a different kind of dialogue, um, that, that it is a structure in and of itself, the funding, and it will, I think it's, it, it will necessitate different kinds of relationships and does make different kinds of relationships that help form these sorts of discussions. I was interested in the sit bed of food as a creative space and was quite um, fascinated as to how perhaps that can be um, exploited or is it exploited today because the, the, the patterning that the woman presented that were kind of dismissed seemed to me very fertile and something that could be developed. Are you involved with any art projects or... You mean actual pro projects that looking at the bed as a space of creativity? Mm -hmm. Not or is that kind no. of a liminal space? Yeah, I, I just think about it. I, mm, I don't think that I know any art projects that okay. deal with the subject. I mean, not with the special uh, situation in mental hospitals. I mean, the bed <coughs> is um, of interest for art, but um, presumably it's kind of outlawed now. And yeah, I don't know, maybe, but no, there's nothing I know. Because the Monk moment. used to, Edvard Monk used to use the sick bed as the sort of explore the liminality of mm -hmm. sickness and creative first thought. Mm -hmm. anyway, that's just a thought. This was a question and I think it, I a, it, it was a question and a thought. Okay. Maybe you had contacts with what's happening today around the sick bed? I mean, today it's different because yeah. um, uh, therapies changed yeah. a lot, so the patients still stay in bed for months. Yeah. So they are, even in the, already the 1920s, bed rest was like um, criticized because uh, uh, patients became uh, like, uh, they escaped from the real world and all the uh, social abilities, uh, they lost all the social abilities. So work therapy began then to um, change psychiatries and so bed rest. Right. Yeah, but quite a few artists become artists because they're confined to bed and all they can do is draw. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I just thought, yeah. Yeah. Frida Kahlo. Yeah, Marcel um, Oost. I mean, all those people. Matisse? Mm -hmm. At the end of his life. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yes. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I'm just curious about um, the notion of uh, femininity in relation to literary. It was uh, charming, Augustine made me think about it. But actually, it's kind of um, everyone's thoughts made me think about it. Um, femininity, not necessarily female, but uh, femininity in relation to cinema or in relation to uh, the body, uh, made me think about the male performance. And I just wondered if you could talk about that a little bit. Um. I'm not exactly 
sure what you mean by femininity. Like that's a, like a really puzzling word to me. Other than, do women act different to men? Is that what you're getting at? I thought that in terms of the, uh, it was more of a parapsychoanalytic way in terms of maybe like masquerade or um, um, uh, femininity having a kind of a multiple or there being oh. kind of layers acting out performativity, that kind I mean, of notion of femininity. These women of which Augustine was one, um, the, there were also male hysterics. I mean, just, but one worked with the cultural tools one had, right? I mean, one certain, there were certain kinds of um, emotional problems that men acted differently because there were possibilities for them that were not available to women. There were certain possibilities for women because people like to look at them, you know, because they were the pleasurable subject of the male gaze, they got to perform. It was a thing they could do. Um, whereas um, male hysteria sometimes took the form of, for example, fugue states, where you read case history from the same time where men would not know who they were and travel great distances and, and Take on new pers to take on new names and and you know because men can kind of cross continents. Women just couldn't. It, it would not be possible. It was not a way of thinking. So in a sense, yes. I mean, the kind of performances that Augustine put on were had a certain kind of power because she was a woman. This is how she could stage her way of speaking about her life. Um, and uh, as I say, to me, it connected very closely with the whole concept of melodrama um, and the early films. I mean, I had the actress actually um, study this film um, called, um, was it called A Painted Woman by G.W. Griffith? It's one of the two who was sort of about a young woman play, played by Blanche Sweet who loses her mind. Um, and she acted by accidentally killing her lover. And it's kind of an amazing performance that I see this continuity of performing um, that was both fantastic and disturbed. I mean, I, Augustine is a, has a sister film that I did. Um, a, called Shadowland, The Life on the Other Side, which takes place in the 1890s. It's also based on a case history or a true story, um, this time the autobiography of what was known as a materializing medium, a woman who during seances could apparently materialize spirits, or so people thought. And again, this was a kind of performance that women were able to do. It was culturally possible. <coughs> to speak in this way. And again, it was highly cinematic. And to me, these two women are both kind of avatars of what cinema is, what cinema became. And I wanted to look at it from that perspective. But I think, yes, they, there was cultural ways that people could take over and kind of co-opt. Um, and Augustine is very complicated. I mean, at least from my reading, because she really was, had gone through these kind of traumatic situations and to what extent is performance and what extent it is not, it's very complicated. But it was her language. I mean, once we enter into the world of Freud and psychoanalysis, I mean, he did not look at his patients. He did not look at his patients because he did not want them to do what Augustine was doing. It becomes narrative. It becomes something else. I love the line from the Hubie Huberman book that um, Charcot, like Charcot could not wrap his mind around the notion of the unconscious because he couldn't bear the idea there was something he couldn't see. There was a kind of private theater of the mind. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think maybe there's something in what you're saying, what you've 
is to respond a little with, um, just in terms of the performance that I did was um, looking at kind of this multiple layering of states and emotional states and expressive states. And there's, um, I'm not quite sure how it relates to the idea of femininity, but there's something <laughs> in there of this and what you're saying, you know, and how um, maybe how, the, how these states can be fluid in a way, layer on top of each other or move between each other. And I was quite kind of, um, I was quite interested in all the kind of emoji stuff of having <laughs> these kind of templates of emotion. And maybe there's something about the shaking and um, the sounding that is to do with how we can kind of slip, there's a kind of slippage of range of states of being that um, can move and um, maybe the meanings and narratives on those um, states or feelings or expressions don't get fixed but can kind of be um, transferred and move more freely, I guess, you know, something. I'm not sure whether that does respond, but <laughs> something. Thank you so much um, for all of your papers. Um, I'm really interested in the idea of reciprocal spaces. Um, writers, performers who place the artist, um, sorry, who place the audience in this intersubjective experience. Um, and I was wondering, I was thinking specifically about <clears throat> Zoe in your film, you were talking about wanting to put us right there where the, the people in the, the medical professionals at the lectures would have been. And also, um, Joe, when you were talking about uh, the bourgeois exhibition, and I think it's something that's commonly found with performance art, um, where you're really present um, and you're part of, you're sort of forced or coerced into um, the performance in some way. And I was wondering if any of you had anything to say about that um, and whether you've had a, any any information about other writers or artists who place their audience in this kind of trauma space, actually, yeah. Thank or artists rather than rather than people who appropriate illness in their work. whether there are any art artists or writers that you know of that sort of place the audience in, in their trauma space whilst they're sort of presenting their work. Um, it might be a question for Florence as well. I know, obviously, uh, Abramovich and, you know, performance artists, like... What kind of trauma space? Well, whether it's sort of um, you're presenting your own lived experience of illness. Um, yeah, it, it, there may be... There isn't an answer right now, I don't know. <laughs> such a huge variety of what kind of trauma are you looking at? I mean, are you talking yeah. about um, autobiographical trauma? Are you talking about, I mean, the exhibition that I curated of Michelle and Mika Ball's work was looking at a case study, um, Sissy, um, a real case study that they transformed into a kind of a fictional film who was in a psychiatric 
hospital for most of her life and is a patient of Francois Dubois. But we've also seen that um, with the charming Augustine work. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's, it's too big of a question. Yeah, sorry. You know, so it's like there's lots of artists sickness. that deal with Holocaust trauma and the question of post-memory. So Vera Frankel, I mean, there are just so many. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. It, it's very... I was interested in the, 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 the bourgeois, that, you, that it was text that you were looking at rather yeah. than a performance. Um, yes. And, and yes. That, and that usually is a performance. So, anyway. Yeah. That's I also I quite <coughs> often how you set, set something up, whether it's a kind of immersive experience or, I mean, this situation where there's audience there and, what, you know, I wonder whether that sets up a kind of divide to that, ex that kind of, I guess, the kind of immersive experience or the transference of, of that trauma state or something. I mean, I suppose we'd have to define what trauma yeah. meanings are. I mean, there's quite, yeah. I mean, I, I, the performance I did earlier, the shaking comes from certain, you know, places I've been in my life of panic attacks that, and shaking and more so then different spiritual practices that use shaking. So it's, you know, yeah, it's quite, Spatial relationship with an audience and the psychological <coughs> space with an audience, I suppose, is going to be. But it's also, I think it is a big question, but I think it raises something really important for us, which is about the relationship between knowledge and understanding. That I, I get quite twitchy, I suppose, about work, perform any work that deals with you know um, illness that might lay claim that you will have some kind of pseudo experience by proxy. Mm. To go and watch a piece about schizophrenia is not to know what it's like to have a psychotic episode in and of itself, but that doesn't mean that one can't be in a hospitable embrace with somebody else's experience, and I think there's a difference there between knowledge and understanding, and I guess that's about what you're talking about, like what is the invitation or what is the offer that this makes. So a piece of work as is, well. You know. So Joanna Bork talks about pain as an encounter um, rather than an event, and I think there's something a crucial shift there and thinking about what kind of listener does this story call upon me to be so it's a, a being with mm, pain yeah. for example is different to looking at pain and I think again that's about the coordinates that a particular piece of work might set up but I think actually you're raising something really important there about knowledge and understanding and empathy I suppose and ethics as well yeah. I'll just say one thing about my project um, which is I would never want to put someone to kind of present, as I say, a kind of raw emotion thing that people are supposed to get off on. Like, like that's not interesting to me. Um, and if you had seen the work the way it should be shown with a 3D projector, which is quite small, is a whole a very odd kind of viewing experience because it's very different than like a 3D IMAX movie. It's funky and shaky and black and white and kind of small, and it's primitive. And uh, I wanted more to defamiliarize cinema so it's not natural, not 3D to make it more real. In fact, to make it less real. Instead of, like you're just worried about the film going through the projector, is the whole thing gonna hold together to the end of the show? It's much less natural, in fact, than projecting at large on a big video screen. It was, me it was meant, as I say, to defamiliarize cinema. The 3D is, is odd. Um, and I intentionally, basically, in the film, I tell the story three times. Once in this very deadpan way, very much as it's presented there, iconography, photography, the still images, the intro titles, no movement, um, very object, quote unquote objectively, then from a much more delirious perspective, and then from a perspective of the melodrama of early cinema. So you don't, you see the same thing three times. So none of them is the real, as the real thing. Um, 
relationship between being in or out of the work, being audience or participant as well. I think there's something, there's a very, very different disciplinary, there's a, there's a difference in discipline between arts and health, where we might be thinking about patient experience or the relationship between the artwork and um, its potential to support. Um, and the kind of critical medical humanities or the critical artists that's perhaps engaging with ideas around histories of cinema, histories of subjectivities, of looking. Um, and I, I think that comes up probably quite a lot for a number of us as well and was certainly something that I had to think about in putting together today about how far or how close to patient experience um, you know, this was going to sit. And I think that there's something about medium and criticality and, um, and, and, and the, and the theatre being a space where we have to decide where we sit in relation to, um, to audiences. So I think, it's, I think it is really, a really, really important question in making, um, in making work about that, that space. Okay, I'm getting... Could we, so we're going to go to the bar after our performance and maybe you want to catch up with us and ask questions in the bar if everybody's able to, to stay. But we have got something else coming up right now, so <coughs> we'll move to it. It's been such a fantastic um, set of presentations and um, you're all hugely appreciated.